I got a two and a half year old, so it uh, there's limited things to be done. It's mm-hmm. more like, yep. How about you it. not be a terror this weekend? That'd be cool. <laughs> Hey everyone, Kenny here, and this is episode 202 of Bourbon Pursuit. And as usual, we have a little bit of the news to go through. And at Bourbon Pursuit, we try to find new and interesting subjects to talk about. And one podcast we thought of doing a while ago was saying, what is the environmental impact of bourbon? And we haven't really found that right guest and that right subject matter because I don't know if that's really what you all find engaging or interesting. So we haven't really done it. However, I find it a little bit interesting. And there was a news report that came out this past week. And this was a partnership that was done by the KDA and Bear in 2018. And it was the, it's the first ever report to actually measure the Kentucky bourbon industry's use of energy, water, and emissions data. Four Roses, Heaven Hill, OZ Tyler, Wild Turkey, Bacardi, Bean Suntory, Brown Foreman, and Diageo all submitted data. And this ensures that it represents about 98% of the KDA membership by production volume. Overall, Kentucky distilleries' use of energy and water consistently declined from 2013 to 2017 and still rested below the global distillery's averages in 2017. The average water use ratio for Kentucky distilleries decreased 41% from 2013 to 2017. This represents a total water use avoidance of more than 6 million kiloliters. Now, I don't know what a kiloliter is. I don't live in the metric system. So to put it in layman terms, it's it's enough to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool nearly 2,400 times. Now, one example of this is Heaven Hill updated its water source at Bernheim Distillery. The company reduced its water usage by 33%. It placed two still condensers onto a cooling tower loop. The distillery now recycles within its operations instead of sourcing new water. This saves around 330,000 gallons of water per day. You can read the entire report in our show notes. Stocks have been on the news lately, and maybe it's because of the trade war with China, but stocks in general, tech usually gets to seem to get the most eyeballs. And folks had just seemed to look past the U.S. whiskey stocks. Now, if you had had the foresight years ago, instead of putting money just into bottles, you would have put it into stocks like Brown Foreman and MGPI. At nearly 30 times at this year's estimated earnings, these two stocks are trading at premiums to to more diversified rivals such as Diageo. MGPI alone rose rose to $98 last year from $6 in 2014. However, Barron's.com is telling people kind of pump the brakes and hold on and don't really go up to that money grab yet because there could be a bubble that's going to burst. And that happened with Celebrity Vodka not too long ago. Now that you have people like Bob Dylan endorsing a whiskey, investors may wonder if we find ourselves backstroking in the bourbon industry because there's now billions of dollars that are being added to adding distillery capacity and more barrels of booze aging in all these warehouses. You can read the full article in our show notes that has quotes from our previous show guests, such as Joe Beatrice of Barrel Bourbon, as well as Chuck Cowdery. Now, today's episode looks at a cultural topic. What if there was a legalized secondary market? Some may argue that we already have that. There's new vintage laws that are being introduced around the country. But then you see the massive flood of online marketplaces that don't have any regulation whatsoever. It's a touchy subject because anyone that's really into bourbon has kind of seemed to find their way into these corners of the web. And let's be honest, most of us has had to do some sort of buy, sell, or trade to get the bottles that we desire. It's the nature of the game. And this show looks at the premise, if you could build your own legal secondary market, what would it look like? At this time, we also want to say thank you to Nate Shu, who's on our podcast today and one of our Patreon supporters for joining us with this topic. Now, with that, we're going to hear from our good friend Joe over at Barrel Bourbon, and then you've got Fred Minnick with Above the Char. Joe from Barrel Craft Spirits here. Barrel Craft Spirits is more than just bourbon. We blend rye, whiskey, rum, and our signature Infinite Barrel Project. Find out more at BarrelBourbon.com. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. What sells a bottle of whiskey? If you're listening to this podcast, you no doubt have spent 
your fair share of money in the liquor store, buying those sweet, precious bottles of bourbon, rye, scotch, Canadian whiskey, Irish whiskey, maybe in a little South African whiskey. So you are not necessarily the person the distillers are trying to target when they are asking the question, how do we sell to the fringe consumer? You see, you and I, we're more of uh, what they would consider the base or the geeks, people who are going to buy whiskey no matter how they market it. So they're always trying to find a way to appeal to that 25-year-old, uh, freshly out of college, MBA, working on Wall Street or in Boise, Idaho at a bank. They're always trying to figure out a way to target that new consumer. And one of the ways that they think they've been able to do this is by saying they are the first at doing something. If you take a look at a lot of the whiskey marketing, you'll see people say they're the first to use this grain, first to use this barrel, first to have a, a distiller with long hair and flip-flops make the whiskey. Yeah, that's a joke, by the way. But, you know, they're always so caught up in saying they're the first, as if that new consumer will care. And the fact is, most people don't care if you are the first to do something in American whiskey. What we do care about, does it taste good? What's the price on it? And can I find a bottle? Now, that new consumer, they may be interested in, like, does it mix well with Coke? Is it good in cocktails? Does it, do I like it neat? What is bourbon? Can bourbon be made outside of Kentucky? No, there's all kinds of questions that these people go through. But the whiskey distillers are going down this path of trying to own the fact that they are first at something. And I just don't think it matters, unless it's really important, like you were the first to make whiskey on the moon. You know what? I would like to know that. But if you're the first to use a certain type of grain from Guatemala, you know, maybe mention that, but don't make that your entire marketing platform. Because if you have to talk about how you were the first at something, that means you're most likely trying to compensate for the fact that your whiskey's not up to snuff. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on Twitter or Instagram. That's at Fred Minnick. Again, that's at Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit. Ryan and Kenny here in the the basement once again having our our gorgeous backdrop but today's topic is going to be something that's interesting i think to everybody in general because if you are even entering the bourbon world which for me i, I found it, i still find it really crazy that you still have all these um 101 discussions on like the facebook bourboner groups and it's like, if you just started drinking wild turkey last week, you're already going into Facebook forms and trying to figure out your way to uh, learn more about it. Like, I mean, take me back to your first, when you started, Ryan, were you actually sitting there trying to like find more information on the internet after you had your first drink of bourbon? <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Uh, after, well, it was a long time ago and I was inundated and surrounded by it, but it was mostly just go into a store talking to friends about it you know i think facebook and the internet has connected everyone and information is so close to your fingertips that just makes it easier for someone to to find out about things how things work and or get you know deeply involved in something very fast and so it kind of takes you down a rabbit hole really quick uh with how much information there is out there and different markets and whatnot yeah i mean i remember just my my entry into bourbon as well and, you know, right today, a lot of us, we, we go and we look after, you know, how can we find uh, the Michter's 10s? How do we find our William Lou Wellers? How do we find all these ones that are really kind of hard to get your hands on? It took me after, I mean, I started, I started like drinking bourbon as my regular drink, you know, when I was 21 in college. And then from there, it just didn't stop. But for people that are on the hunt, even to find Happy Van Winkle, it took me almost four to five years out of college to even know that these even existed. Like I didn't even, I didn't go try hunting for stuff. I didn't, I wasn't looking on the top, top shelves or racks. I was looking in my price bracket. Yeah. Like Elijah Craig and Maker's Mark were premium for me. It was like, uh, those were like going on a limb and spending a, you're like, Oh man, $30 a bottle, man. That's like, that's breaking the bank. <laughs> it really <laughs> like, was. Like, uh, and now that's like, ah, uh, that's just like an everyday drinker. Yeah, you know? I mean, uh, Old so. Forester, oh, sorry, I mean, Old Forester is my go-to. And then every once in a while, I'd splurge on four rows of small batch. And that was like my, 
Oh, that's my, like uh, that was my my. That's like a graduation or some really big celebration. You're like, <laughs> oh, somebody got married. Let's break out the four roses or uh, you know Elijah Craig seventeen or something. Not not the way it is now. You know. Yeah, and because at that point, people eventually figure out, oh, they go to this forum. I want to learn more, and then they're like, oh, what's this whole secondary thing? And then all of a sudden, people are like, oh. Oh, I can make money off this. Oh, I didn't know that Van Winkles were really hard to find. I didn't know whatever was really hard to find. Now I go and find it and I try to flip it or try to do whatever. And uh, that's all I'm going to do. And well, <laughs> it's it's created this a, elusive secondary market that everybody, at least I'm pretty sure that if you listen to this podcast, it's not because you're drinking wild turkey last week. It's because you know the culture and you know exactly what's what's actually happening out there. And that is really the topic of today. And this idea was brought to us by none other than Nate Shu. And Nate is a huge bourbon enthusiast. He's also a Patreon supporter of ours. So Nate, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. So I kind of want to gauge, you know, your level here. Like when did you start getting into bourbon and when did that bug really, really bite you hard? Well, <clears throat> It kind of is in my blood. My grand, I came from basically cocktail culture. So my grandparents had, you know, nightly bourbons. Um, they've been drinking, we call bourbon the family drink. So it was literally, no matter how all the members of my extended family, sooner or later, you come around to bourbon, whether you start, you know, like in college or you come later on, you know, in your 30s or 40s, it becomes your drink. So I've always been around it, but my, you know, my family weren't like, you know, fancy bourbon drinkers. They were, you know, my step grandfather was a Heaven Hill guy. My uh, my grandparents were Bourbon Supreme, the old one in uh, Illinois, the one before they before the rock got stuff that they have now. You know, with the little tassel on and everything. That was their drink. You know, it was a nightly one, and and, uh, and it just after a while, it it does infect your blood in that way. I mean, like you guys, man. I wasn't college. I wasn't drinking anything fancy when I uh, and I'm you know I hate to say this, but my roommate uh, went to UT. Um, so he brought back the love of Makers um, um, after college. And so Makers was my fancy, uh, was our fancy bourbon that we would have. Oh, yeah. Um, when there, we weren't like going to grab a handle of Jack Daniels for everyone who just wanted to do shots of whiskey, which, you know, to our mind now, it's like shots of whiskey? What are you talking about? It's <laughs> <That's laughs> a sin now. Yeah. <laughs> it is a sin. So, so yeah, for the longest time, um, it was, and I still have an absolute love of makers. I'm sure you guys have like that cheaper, lower end bourbon that like is just, you have a special place in your heart for, you go out to a bar and you're not sure what you want to get. And you're like, ah, give me that, whatever that is. That's definitely makers for me. But a couple of years ago, and honestly, I can't remember what triggered it. You know, it was like, you take that first step into, Hey, maybe this stuff can get better. I mean, at the time um, I was, uh, I'd spent many years trying to learn about wines you know, which is its own rat hole, very expensive rat hole to go down into. Um, and started going to get getting back on the just a regular daily bourbon drinking train. And um, I'm trying to think back of what basically that first little bridge bottle is. What was it that kind of set you over to wait a minute? What we got here? Um, and I honestly can't remember. Uh, I can't remember. So <laughs> it was kind of like a, there was something that just, I it just about happened this morning. It is. You just think, mm -hmm. what the hell was over? I mean, I suppose you go back through your old receipts and figure out what that one was. But um, basically once you kind of get like, it became an association of like, I know how after drinking so much wine and she were like, you know, there's a difference in wines in that, you know, a red wine tastes like this, but a higher end wine taste can taste amazing. Why can't it be the same way with whiskey? So you kind of go down that track of like, and then you kind of figure out, hey, what do I like? You know? And so it was advantageous then, you know, and this this goes back, you know, 10, 15 years, that the brands don't have the popularity and the cachet and where we're at with social media, where everything is in your face as far as get the, get the uh, fancy stuff, get the limited releases. It was just kind of like, what do I like to drink? It became mm -hmm, an easy, mm -hmm. easy kind of a uh, transition into what we have now, which is... Uh, Let's just say it's a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think was probably the the pushing point that that started making everything a little bit crazy? You know, I I always look at it and think of I, I measure things by what I would call the Pappy Van Winkle index, and mm -hmm. and that's sort of really what kind of started a whole craze of of secondary market and some other things that are hard to get. I mean, what what did you see as that sort of catalyst? That's a pretty good 
good one there. I mean, when it would start to show up on TV shows and kind of the buzz, this is again, probably pre the social media environment when we're in now. So maybe a roll back to like 2010, 2011, 2012. I remember seeing an episode of, um, Oh shoot, the New Orleans show on HBO. I don't recall the name of it at this moment, but the famous chef that did a cameo on it, uh, David Chang, I think is his name. Um, he brings out a bottle of Pappy 15 at the end of the show, just to kind of, uh, you know, bring everyone together. It was kind of like, hey, it was a total like a name drop thing, but it was like kind of in your face of like, hey, the fancy, you know, uh, famous folks drink it. You should too. So there's almost like a top down push of to make it a luxury brand, which for folks that have been buying it and drinking it for so many years is kind of like, what are you talking about? This is the stuff that I can get in the shelf every day, which probably makes the the luxury brands consider at least these days luxury brands of uh, bourbon to be strange for people in other words a really fine piece of fashion like a clothes you know there wasn't a time that you could you know buy ferragamo shoes for like you know five bucks right they've <laughs> always been expensive yeah. that's just a fact of life what we have here is a little bit strange especially i mean you start getting to the dusty room and your you know stuff that your grandfather bought for five bucks and all of a sudden we're you know paying 200, 300, 500 bucks for it. It's like, what? That doesn't make much sense. I mean, today, I mean, even, you know, going back to stuff, you know, five years uh, ago, you know, stuff has gone up 300, 400, 500%. It's that disconnect, I think, which drives a lot of the frustration in the bourbon community specifically. You know what I mean? It's just, it's when, when something is at a, at, at a price level where you were the, um, it's part of the price theory of price takers and price makers. Back then, uh, the bourbon community were the price uh, makers. They, you know, were like it's twenty bucks a fifth, thirty bucks a fifth. That's just what it is. I am the. We are the buying community. We have kind of spoken. Now the situation is reversed. Now they're price takers because the price makers are the folks with the inventory and the supply, and they can. The community at large can be can want to be a price maker all they want, but no one's going to sell it to them for that. It's just not going to happen. And so that kind of reversal is very jarring for people. And it makes, I mean, definitely uh, has an understandable element of frustration, which is what you guys probably see every day. Well, and I think bourbon is the like perfect product because for someone to sell, because it's rare, scarcity, Mm -hmm. people love scarcity. They love the rareness of it. You have things like single barrels where everything's unique. And so it kind of like can dry. And like you said, with Dusty's, they're not making anymore. So it's mm-hmm. more rare, more valuable, more collectible to people. And so it's, it just appreciates over time because uh, they're not making that like they used to. And then it's every barrel is unique. So it's like a, a unique product and like the perfect product to sell because of that. Absolutely. And so the, you know, really we were trying to gauge on how do we start talking about what a legal secondary market would look like if, if we could actually imagine one. But let's go ahead and think about the, the current, the current aspect of the secondary market. And what's that? <laughs> what? A secondary market? <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of it. It doesn't exist. The fourth tier? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The fourth. Actually, it's probably close to the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth tier after, mm-hmm. after yeah. it trades hands all these times. But let's talk about what, what are the issues that are there today? You know, other than a it being completely illegal, but what are, what are the other issues <laughs> that we see um, with with the current state of state of the union of the secondary market? I guess you could say. Well, I mean, you really it's it kind of does begin and end with the fact that, like Fred said on Tuesday, alcohol is a controlled substance. There's really for as much as for as much as market forces can change that, there'll always be an element of control that's got to go to somebody. It cannot be an unfettered open market. It just can't. That, that's that's you know you got to start from that point. Nothing's ever going to change that. And nothing should, to be quite honest. It, it, it deserves to be a controlled substance. But what you, the next step that you want to take there is: Do you want to have a market, like by literal definition of market, which is the free flowing information of buying and selling? Uh, a way to ensure the product you're buying is what you're at, what you're buying and who you're selling it to. Trans market transparency, the things that you would see in the financial market. I think I've been uh, reading up again. I, I liked, um, I think it was Nick from Breaking Bourbon who had a pretty um, detailed vision about what they want the secondary market could be. 
Um, but I think what it lacked was a tr element of truly a market because and his his vision was you could bottles could go or bottles could go in. Um, and but as a consumer, you could only, only thing you could take out was bottles. But I think and I think that in itself does not make a market because a market in, involves it's not just products changing hands; it's products and, and, and cash basically changing hands. All right. So um, he, his idea was that your bottles are your currency. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and in that case, that doesn't I mean, if we were in a barter economy, sure, or, or at least in that sub economy as a barter economy, it'd be great. But the reality is, of course, that's not going to. That doesn't cut the mustard. That's not going to create a, a true market there. I think. But the secondary market is kind of a barter system, really, because like. I mean, it's become, yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, you, you you have bottles that you're selling for, but to get the, the funds to buy the bottles that you want. And mm -hmm. so it's like it's all this made up money kind of moving around, uh, <laughs> exchanging like hands just to get like because <laughs> I have access to certain bottles. Somebody has access to certain that I want. And so it's just like mm -hmm. all this moving around trading between people, even though there's money involved, it's like, it's staying within the system. It seems like it's not, uh, you know, going outside of it. Mm -hmm. it it's, it's a real element of what the market would need, I think. And again, one of some of the best analogs you can see to this is, is the financial world is where are the market makers? The, 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 the and, and the role of the person that's going to bring the buyers and the sellers together and who has, to use more and more financial nomenclature, who has the order book in front of them, who knows what the offers are coming in and what the um, offers in for both sides. Because right now, like we talked about price takers, price makers, it's a one-way street. People with, a, with the inventory are just like, this is the price, we're done. Um, I don't know if you guys have been on Wine Searcher, um, but um, I, they have very fascinating graphs about offer prices. And so I've, I've looked through, you know, all the typical ones, you know, Pappy, BTAC, and the rest um, over a five-year period. And it's fascinating that the prices don't change. There's the, the, the movement is just not there. You'd think it would appear to be logical that, wow, okay, I can't unload as a store, for example, unload this Pappy 20 for 1800 bucks. Well, maybe I can unload it for 1400 or 1500 It's, you know, seeing as they probably got it at retail or at least close to retail, it's, they're still making a good deal of money. It just sits there and it'll mm -hmm. sit there for a long time. And you think if, um, and because they have no, them since they're their own market, they're making their own market. They don't care about that. No one else wants to buy or no one wants to buy at that price. It'll just sit there. But a market maker, uh, given a commission, of course, and this you increase the cost of, of, of bottles in general, is motivated to make the sale. You know what I'm saying? And, and the, what we have now is we really don't, we have, the, the sides are so far apart um, that there's no one there motivated to make the sale. You get a market maker, he's motivated to make the sale. Um, so, and that, what, you know, ideally, of course, that could kind of bring the prices, the, uh, the, the supply and demand more into balance, maybe get a little more movement in prices and to act, you know, so we, so, Give that would give people a little more opportunity because of the fair and open market. People, have, you know, again, have the ability to buy it. Um, it sounds, you know, obviously closely like an auction system like we have at the international mm -hmm. realm, like with scotch and the rest. But you look at that, you look at those prices and it's the same thing there. They just the prices don't move. They sit up, they sit there and it, it's, you know, it, Looking at it, you almost say to yourself, is this some kind of cabal, you know, that's setting these things? Because they, it's just, it's fascinating to me that for a luxury good like this, which it doesn't really have a clear set value, you know what I mean, for the for reselling these bottles. They, it's just like it's come into being and it becomes an expectation for the folks that are selling it. And that become that expectation is then put, goes across all of the channels to sell these bottles, where the auctions personal, you know, the, 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 uh, the more, uh, gray markets or the retailers who pretty much at this point are just as much a member of the secondary market as individuals. And so you brought up um, a, a good point. And I, I kind of want to talk about this too. You know, you talk about wine searcher, there's also mm -hmm. bo bottle blue bottle blue book that's out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is, these are, this is publicly accessible. Um, it's not like some of the secondary markets where you got to know somebody that knows somebody to make sure that you can get in. 
I mean, it's not really that hard. It's just kind of like, oh, find it, click that request. request. Yeah, it's, it's actually <laughs> refer it's, a friend. Yeah, no, it's probably like it's like the, the worst kept secret in history, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not hard to find it. However, stuff like Wine Search and Bottle Blue Book, like it's it's publicly accessible information. Do you think this actually hurts, or does it help a, a secondary market, or even just the general market? Well, value should. There should be some debate about values. They shouldn't just be hidden, you know, think basically behind the curtain and, you know, at least uh, to use the auction example, like the auctioneer has the magic value behind him and he sets it and that's just it. I mean, there should be like, you should be able to kind of challenge from a community perspective why this bottle is worth, why it is valued at this much, right? Because uh, the other problem we have, one of, the other, one of the other problems in this particular market is it's so thin. The supply is, I mean, we're talking you know, hundreds of tens, hundreds, and in some cases, well, what's a, what's a barrel of willow? Like what? 168, 180. I mean, they're just, it's ridiculous. The amount of the, the, the thinness of these markets. So how do you value that? You know, where, where are these values coming up with? I mean, yeah, that's a good it's, question. It's because <laughs> I was just going to say, cause typically it's like, where did the values begin? Because typically it's like double, you know, what you paid for it. And then, but you have some like the Van Winkles, which, or like three, four, three five, to four X, yeah. you know, times. And it's like, well, how did those become? Cause they're not, they're like less rare than some of these other bottles that yeah. and it are. Moves and, and it stays, you know, it, it, it like jumps people, this, this, the three to four five X comes up and I would ex expect it for it to keep going up. In other words, if it's, if it immediately jumps up to a value of that level, why does it stop? You know, it would not, it doesn't seem logical that it would just stop because like, mm -hmm. for example, uh, Pappy 23 sits at what 2600 or so and secondary and it just like gets up there and just stays you know i mean if there if if there's price if if there's people willing to pay that much for that bottle at that price i mean you're already so far over what is considered msrp why isn't the price even higher you mm -hmm. know you're you're likely to find someone there when again why does these what the, the price movement i mean it was to make many many interesting economic papers um, trying to find the price theory of this. I've, I've read a few just in general and like luxury goods and it doesn't really address this because bourbon's such a very unique industry, unique product. But it just, having the transparency and market makers, apart from the legality, which is a whole nother trick bag of, uh, you know, who, who's going to solve that one, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just to make it, you know, it, I mean, you, you talked about it on Tuesday. I mean, just from the shipping angle of it, that's a thorny mess. And uh, the, the uh, 21st Amendment gives you one sentence about what the states can do, which basically is everything. In other words, you don't have a lot of clarity there. And that's why you've had the, the series of decisions to try to tease out what that precisely means. And if you've read some of the dissenting opinions and of, of some of those decisions that especially uh, Brian from Sipper and Corn was talking about on Tuesday, it's a fascinating read because it doesn't cut across ideological or party lines. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing about pricing, kind of a few examples that amaze me, some like cured oak or tornado, you know, is a $75 bottle within with two or three years, it was like only two to 300 bucks, you know, for those. And then like all of a sudden, like, five, you six, know, seven, five, eight. six, and then now they're at nine, you know, and it's like, well, how's that? How does that happen? You know, like, uh, and then like bottles, you know, they immediately come out and they're, say double or triple X, but then somebody opens ones and drinks one and the review's bad. So it drops down, but then somebody says they like it, then it goes back up and then it's, you know, it's kind of crazy. Well, you know? there is the community aspect. <laughs> I mean, the community has grown a lot larger in the more recent years. And once, you know, you have a cured Oak or a tornado that uh, was only around for a little bit. And then it, it sort of, it follows a, uh, a probably a pricing structure that you see of dusty bourbon. And that is, pretty equivalent because you're never going to have it again. And if you want it, you're going to have to pay for it. And all of a sudden people are like, Oh, this is great. And there was only what a couple thousand bottles right. that ever released. You know, you, you think of just old granddad from the 1980s. There's probably, there are probably hundreds of thousands that yeah. were released. <laughs> so it's, it's more scarcity and stuff like that. Sure. And, and so Nate, well, the other, investment. <laughs> yeah, it is definitely a good investment. That's, and I think that's part of the reason why people look at this um, and you can't, 
you can't blame them for not looking at this as an investment because it actually is an investment opportunity for yeah, for, our, for many people, even people that have large collections uh, that have a lot of bottles open, they still invest and buy rare things like just rare old mictors. They'll buy uh, rare, very old Fitzgeralds and they'll sit on them because they know in five, six, seven years, it's going to be worth a little bit more and they're going to make what they had on their investment. What was it? The the economists we had from U of L on, they said like they did a research that from 2015 to like now, like if you invested in bourbon, you've seen annual gains of 200 mm-hmm. percent like uh, on average. And you're like, holy cow, I, like you can't get that in anywhere. Yeah. In Certainly. any investment. It doesn't help that yeah, university researchers are helping fuel this. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, CNBC would talk about scotch a few times a year uh, about the investment and as as a a category of things to invest in that were, you know, not your typical securities. And it would always be the same way. Like, yep, it's a great investment along with, uh, with rare wines, um, if stored properly and the rest. Mm-hmm. So but yeah, other, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, nope, uh, go ahead. Well, the other thing I, I kind of want to talk about was I had talked about it earlier is the community aspect. The one, the one thing that's, that's very, um, different with this, you know, we, you had talked about since it is a controlled substance, it needs to be regulated. However, the community does a very, very good job of, of regulating this market. Um, and if this were to kind of move into a, a, a legal-ish terms, and we can kind of talk about what legal avenues there are here in a second. It's kind of the next segment. But what happens if you remove that community aspect where you are, you're doing this based on trust? And there is that that sort of connection because we're all part of the forms. We can read. There's out of the years, there's only been a handful of times where somebody's actually gotten burned. And so what happens if you remove that that community aspect from it? Well, if you have the same level of trust in the individuals that are holding the alcohol, assessing the alcohol, um, then you'd have something similar. Um, it's a matter of my, you know, trust migration from the guys that you know and worked with, with some other organization, whatever it would happen to be. Um, kind of like it, it seems to work well for, especially like the, like the auction, international auctions, as people have a seem to have a healthy uh, amount of respect for them. Like they're not gonna, you know, sell you uh, counterfeits, and they take at least a little bit of. It seems to me a lot of uh, effort to make sure that they're not accepting counterfeits to sell um, either. It's, it's one of the, be one of the difficulties in bringing a, uh, a gray market or black market, if you want to use a more harsh term into the light um, is, is, is the taking that trust because obviously in that kind of market trust is everything. You have nothing else. There's no one else to, no one else is settling uh, or setting rules or anything like that. You're, you're, you're trusting the person that you're doing business with. Um, so, you know, could you be doing this? You could, in theory, be conducting the same business minus, you know, a percentage going to whatever is the official. There are actually more than a few percentages because you have state taxes, of course, to get in the, to get their cut, which in the end will mollify a good deal of states. Mm-hmm. If they have their money. The, a lot of the uh, complaints will kind of go away. Um, it all, it all I mean, always boils mm-hmm. down to money. Uh, we, it does. No doubt. And, and I'm sure you're seeing the same kind of issues uh, uh, with marijuana as, you know, as the states legalize it, there becomes a more formal market. You're moving for, again, from a black market to a to a more uh, open market where you're dealing with different people versus the trust that obviously p- folks that deal with illicit uh, uh, substances would do with each other. And certainly in a case of a, a class, like it was a two or what, I mean, a much more seriously controlled substance versus vice alcohol. Where trust is, so that's a be a very difficult. That would be a problem. Like if you were, if there would be a formal step forward to do that, you know, uh, it would, through all fifty states, is how do you migrate the the trust that individuals that are sell, buying and selling and trading bottles now uh, can do? Certainly, with it costing them more. <laughs> mm-hmm. Ryan, what do you think would happen if you remove that that sort of community aspect? You know. Uh, I tell my like family and my wife about this secondary morning. They're like, "Are you insane? Like <laughs> you're uh, you're trusting these random people on the internet to uh, sell you or buy, and you're shipping them and hoping, and then like you're taking all the risk shipping and buy." I think 
that I, I'm amazed at how well it is regulated within the community. And I would be, I just don't know there would be as much thoughtfulness from a regulatory as there is now currently with uh, the bourbon community, because it is like a circle of trust and like this little aspect of, and we're not going to let any one mess with it, you know? And so, uh, I don't know. I, I, I kind of like the way it is, but well, I can tell you this: if if you if you buy a bottle from like Christie's or something like that, an auction house, and it gets lost in shipment, um, they might refund you your money. Uh, they're probably not going to replace it with a nice equivalent bottle, but they're they're sure as shit not going to send you like a bunch of like free samples because <laughs> you know they feel bad about it, right? You know, being lost in the mail. That's one thing that uh, you know you can't. You're not going to have that that sort of personal connection out of it either. Yeah, and because we're all in this well, together, they- nobody wants to get screwed and. You know, and when things happen, you feel bad and you empathize with that person. And so you're going to do what's right to make them, you know, feel good about the whole thing. Because you are them. We are all the same, you know, same bread, same people that are passionate about this. And so I feel like we would do a much better job of taking care of each other versus, uh, you know, buying from liquor stores or whatever. Because they probably have policy, yeah, you're refunded or whatever. But, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think the community has sex much better. So let's talk about what are some of those legal routes today. Are you a fellow podcaster like me? Then you need to go and check out Chartable.com. We've been using their tools for over three months with amazing results. They help podcasters understand, grow, and monetize their audiences. Their tools are used by over 10,000 podcasters, from the smallest indies to the top networks that are driving millions of downloads. Sign up for their podcast analytics to start tracking your chart rankings and reviews from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, across 150 countries. Join hundreds of other podcasters that are using the new smart links to figure out which marketing channels are driving your listener growth. Smart links are trackable URLs that automatically route listeners to your podcast in their favorite apps, and it counts both clicks and downloads. Go now and check out their podcast analytics for free right now at chartable.com. There are more craft distilleries popping up around the country now more than ever before. So how do you find out the best stories and the best flavors? Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month club, and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Along with two bottles of hard-to-find whiskey, Rackhouse's boxes are full of cool merchandise that they ship out every two months to members in 40 states. In Rackhouse's June box, they're featuring a distillery that claims to be the first distillery to stout a whiskey. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is shipping out two bottles from there, including its Beer Barrel Bourbon and Beer Barrel Rye, both of which were finished in barrels that were once used to mature America's number one selling bourbon barrel aged stout. And if you're a beer guy like me, you would know that's New Holland's Dragon Milk. Go to RackhouseWhiskeyClub.com to check it out and try a bottle of Beer Barrel Bourbon and Beer Barrel Rye. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. So let's talk about what are some of those legal routes today. So you've you've got yourself a bottle of very, very old Fitzgerald, or you got yourself a bottle of what Nate was talking about earlier, a really old bottle of Bourbon Supreme that probably actually isn't worth much. With a tassel. Yeah, that that really actually isn't worth have I do have that one. It's very nice. Nice. It actually brought brought tears to my mother's eyes because that was the same kind of bottle she used to pour for my grandmother. Nice. Um, So it was was a memory thing. So it was really nice, but it's decent enough bourbon. I was like, Mm -hmm. "Ah, it's all right. (laughs) So there, there are a few different ways that you can sort of regulate some of these things. And, you know, in Kentucky, they passed the the vintage spirits law, which allows you to actually take vintage spirits. Uh, However, there's still a lot of gray areas in trying to figure out what actually it is classified as vintage per se. But, you know, that's, that is one way that is a, a legal way to be able to sell some of your bottles but it still doesn't resolve like the issues of like pappies for instance if some still in distribution or on shelves you're not allowed to take part in that vintage law or whatever so it still kind of leaves some holes or things left to be desired yeah i was about to say and and you know nate you're you're in you're in the dc market correct Mm -hmm. so that is the 
I don't want to say the Wild West, but it's oh, it's wilder. It's, it's, it's pretty it's, wild. It's, it's liberal and it's, it's liquor laws. It's, it's wilder than anybody else. Let's put it that way. Uh, and yeah. and so the the rules that are in D.C. for anybody that's kind of unaware about what you can do there, if you're a store, you can buy things on the open market. You can buy them from anybody else, and you can resell them in your stores. That's pretty. It's pretty willy nilly, and and how that works. Um, do you think it would be in, for you, Nate, would it be advantageous for other states to kind of have these these laws that allow people to sell through a legal route such as what DC does, or does that hurt? No, it would be useful, but good luck getting it through a control state like Virginia. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, it given an avenue to, you know, they would have, I think liquor uh, buyers in DC kind of understand it's the wild west. You know, if they see like, wow, this is old Fitzgerald decanter on the shelf at, you know, my favorite liquor store just appeared there. Right. Obviously very old. Like they know it wasn't just, they know the drill, like, yep, somebody sold to them. They're going to sell it back to me. Like kind of understand that's the way it is. And this is a normal thing, but, and, and you would trust the liquor store again, talk about trust to make sure that it's not, you know, someone didn't take it, dump it out, put Jim Beam in it. Um, versus you do it with the control state um, that's much more regulated. Now they have to make sure, just like Kentucky, the stuff by Kentucky, it's like, well, how do I know that what you're selling me, this allegedly dusty old Fitzgerald, is actually a dusty old Fitzgerald? You know, mm-hmm. I mean, they as a because they're they as um, in the control state, they have all the control and they have all the responsibility. You know, and just uh, just imagine the one time that they resell a bottle with something poisonous in it, you know, not that someone's like literally trying to poison, but something got dumped. Who knows how it could happen. It would only take one time. Like, you know, Fred was talking Tuesday. It only takes one really bad event. Um, and it, and that kind of that leads into today's secondary market. Like what if we've ta- we've seen the stories of folks getting, you know, getting had with uh, fake counterfeit bottles, but what if it's something that's worse, you know, mm-hmm. And then, the, and then the investigators follow that trail back to that community. It's over. I mean, it would take one time, and it's over. So the control states are, would take a very much more strict, like, oh, I got to figure this stuff out. So you got to give me everything under the sun. You got to give me receipts. You got to be verified that um, before they would take it and do it. Versus, you know, DC being very lax in terms of, ah, sure, looks like it. It looks like it's what it is. Let me go ahead and just resell it. Buyer beware. Yeah, and and I guess. You know, one thing I was kind of thinking of an analogy while you were talking about this, you know, buying and then reselling It's, you know, you think of even Justin's House of Bourbon and a lot of people that are doing this, that they're essentially bourbon pawn shops. Yeah, that's all they really are. And it's it's a way for them to kind of make their margins on on whatever that is they need to be able to buy. But you do bring up a really good point. Um, How and, and you've got to be able to trust the store in regards of. Yeah, is this is this actually a very very old Fitzgerald? I mean, I can just tell you from my own personal experience, even being here in Louisville, that there is a store that I bought some stuff from, and uh, and then he was like, "Hey, I got these other things," and a customer um, sold them to me, and they were bottles of very very old Fitzgerald, and you know he he didn't really know exactly what the market price was. It's really hard for me to even figure it out for myself, but I I also didn't have as much trust in the store to actually know if they are genuine or counterfeit because they can't prove uh, provenance. They don't know exactly how many times it's traded hands. So it's, do you see some some things like that like as, as big causes for concern with, um, with this type of law as well? Uh, certainly on a state by state basis. I mean, I think to an extent, like the inter- the auction houses have kind of figured out enough um, and they understand how their reputation, um, rely- the reputation as an auction house is relies on the reputation that the, the items that they set for auction are what they say they are, because they understand that. Like again, it only takes one or two bad ones, and then you get a bad reputation. And then even a, even the the, the big auction houses can uh, can really suffer for it. So it's just. I know it can. It's Kentucky was trying to do a good thing there, but I'm not quite sure they thought it all the way through. Invitation is just. I mean, from this, from the post that uh, 
that uh, Sip and Corn has put on. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. I'm trying to figure it out. But, you know, it, working that into some of these other states, I mean, it all just goes back to the damn 21st Amendment. It's states, you got all the control. You get to figure out everything. And what we have is just a mess. <laughs> and there's everything that we would think, we could, you know, you'd be able to want to accomplish to do. And it's just, you know, I, I, is it a question? If, do, we're not trying to solve the problem of, I mean, we have the, 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 the safety aspect is really big, but it's just like, I have a good, I want to sell it. You want to buy it. Let's make this happen. You know, give us the avenue to do that. You know, and then it applies to, it applies to everything, you know, it applies to all of Like we, the guy in the show talked about, you know, an AR-15, um, he could sell it to his, um, sell to his buddy with no uh, consequences, nothing, but he couldn't do the same thing with a bottle of Jack Daniels. Mm -hmm. it's Absolutely. Just, it's, it's, it's a tough one. I, it's from everything that we want to talk about, everything we want to propose, how are we going to get around 50 states, 50 laws? Guns and liquor. And, yeah, that's, how, that's what it all goes know. back to. <laughs> and, I, and I think you brought up a good point, Kenny, about like, you know, having Justin, I think if you were to have this legalized, you would have to have a few dedicated store owners who would embrace this and make them like kind of the, because if you just go to everyday liquor stores and people are buying and selling, like they're not going to give as much, they're not going to put as much thought into it as someone like Justin is because he comes from our community. He knows what to look for. You're, you're not going to have a dedicated person at each store to like analyze and determine if these bottles are fakes or real or whatever. And they, they're not going to know. And so, um, well, I, think, I can tell you the average liquor barn employee probably won't know. Or total <laughs> right. Wine exactly. Or like that. Exactly. So I think the way it could work is having something like Justin's house of bourbon, um, in each state or market or whatever to, to be that kind of go-to place for the, this kind of sales. Yeah. And the commerce side, for total wine and liquor barn, it probably doesn't make sense for them to even enter that arena because there's just it's probably too much time and investment yeah. that they don't they don't need to worry about. But the other thing I kind of want to talk about is you know we brought up auction houses a few times. Nate has, and mm -hmm. yeah, there's there's a lot of them out there. You've got Christie's. Um, there's actually quite a bit that happen. Most of them happen overseas, uh, over in Europe, and yeah, you can you can ship your bottle to them. They'll inspect it. Um, they'll give you a percentage of whatever it sells at auction. Um, and this is a, this is a legal route. You can do this. Um, there's, there's nothing that's stopping you from doing it. I think there's one maybe out of New York as well. I, I can't recall, or there's one in California, uh, two, but Sotheby's does some too. Yeah. yeah. And, and I guess, uh, the question to you, Nate, um, is this helpful from a, from a legal standpoint, um, or does this actually, or is this, and is this bad maybe from a community standpoint? Because could this be an increase in awareness, which also means increase in price for these type of items? Well, I, it's very likely it would be an increase in price for the things that you want to buy. That's kind of the, the nature of an auction. The advantage there is uh, obviously this tradition of auctions goes back a long, 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 long time. So from a commerce perspective, a regulator's perspective, they understand that like, oh, you want to have these things, great. It goes to the things you want to sell, goes to an auction house. And then they, they consider that, you know, a legal entity to move the product and make sure that, again, it's not going to the hands of the people um, that it shouldn't go into. But, yeah, it would definitely, they, the auction, based on their commission, the commissions on the uh, strike price, they're going to want higher prices. Not that they're going to boost it artificially, but the nature of the auction and the nature of the demand right now would mean that that wouldn't, that might solve the access problem. Like you have the ax, you have the ability to sell and the ability to buy, but I don't think it would do anything for pricing, at least on the um, on the limited releases. You don't think so? I, I, I kind of see it a little bit different. I, I think I think of, um, you know, uh, we'll say we'll say a 2018 bottle of George T. Stag is at, mm -hmm. we'll say at today's market, it's 350, 400, somewhere around there. Uh, you put this on a more visible market, something that is um, freely accessible to anybody to get to, and it's and it's publicized. It's got Facebook ads. It's got uh, everything that is uh, you know you can find through when you're scrolling through your phone and social media. And I think I think the price 
increases by another 15, 20% because of, uh, of that right now. Uh, and somebody just commented that say Skinner's auction is getting 23% buyer's premium now. So there's, there's definitely, um, I think, I think that would, I don't know if it hurts values. It just increases them mm -hmm. for people that are trying to obtain it through those legal means as well. Well, it's just another hand and they, they want their cut. So it's going to naturally just mm -hmm. increase because yeah, any, fifth, any, fifth and sixth tier. Yeah, fifth and sixth tier. And yeah, so it's any like, kind of market you put in, it's it, going to be a cut. It's amazing. If you could count from the day it was distilled, this bourbon, to like how many hands is exchanged to – the secondary market there's literally like from barrel brokers to distillers to to bottling to distributors retail stores to the it's amazing how many hands and middlemen there are in this industry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the other thing you know i kind of want to push over to you nate is you know we'll, we'll say that it's pandora's box you can choose however this is going to work if you were to have a legal secondary market what would that what would that look like in your mind we talked a lot about a lot of the principles of it, how uh, I think for my personal opinion, the, the, uh, the, the core of it is to create a liquid market for both uh, the products you're selling and then the, the, the cash coming out. So that's important. Having a, a bona fide, a market maker that would probably have to double as a registered agent to take uh, the said bottles. So it would be kind of a, it would be, they would probably have to have two hats. Um, that was, that is ready and willing to make a sale. Like their job is to not let the, is to nudge the sellers to not sit at ridiculously high prices based on valuations. that They're just kind of pulling out of their behind. Like, no, they want, they're motivated to make a sale. And It'll so be like real estate agents, you know, like, yeah, exactly. Comps you, you, and everything. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, it's like, and so I think gradually that would bring a much more reasonable level, more reasonable um, of, of, of pricing for those bottles. Um, and so you have the, transpa you, the transparency of the market. You have a motivated market maker or set of market makers to make the sale and the ability not only to have the individuals, you know, put bottles in to sell and, or facilitate trading, which it should absolutely should be a part of the said market as well, but the ability to actually get cash minus the appropriate taxes and fees, which are just going to have to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, then you have, how do you solve the state? What, how do you deal with the state's problem? Um, apart from giving them their cut based on the, the state you're in. In other words, this, I don't think this could be like a, you know, oh, this market only exists in New York. So you send your stuff to New York and all the transactions just takes place, take place um, in the state of New York. I don't think that would necessarily work. So I think, well, perhaps not a federal solution, at least one that addresses all of the state's concerns. And I think having that, again, that registered agent who's also the market maker can uh, do their best, do what they do uh, to ensure that the folks don't get, uh, the wrong folks don't get those bottles, you know, keeps the market uh, legitimate and keeps it legal. I think uh, Ryan brought up a pretty funny way to put this in regards of real estate. It could honestly be uh, treated as as such like that. You know, you've you've got your you've got your agents, you've got your your, your mortgage brokers, you've got all these kind of people, but not necessarily that that's sort of analogous to this. But you would have essentially an online listing market where. People have valuations and you can buy at those particular prices. Um, I don't know what the, you know, Zillow for bottles, <laughs> Zillow for bottles, basically, yeah. but I don't, I don't know like what the analogy is to there to say you default on your loan and now you have to put your house up for auction. I don't know what, what the analogy is there that something would actually go to auction unless that you just felt like, oh, okay, we'll just see what the market will bear on something like this. Well, I think like Nate yeah. said, it just kind of helps if you do have brokers and agents, it kind of helps keep prices in line and what the true value is versus just some abstract kind of number that we're pulling out, you know, in these markets currently. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting, I, I finished a book recently. It's kind of an interesting analog here. It was, it's all about the uh, concert ticketing business. Those are the history of pricing and why we're paying such enormous prices that we have today. But it talked 
talks a, bit, a lot about the concert ticket secondary market. I mean, they mm -hmm. literally use the same word. So I'm listening to this going, I've got the book going, wow, this is, there's a lot of lessons here. What, you know, obviously, the, the industry is different, the products are different. But it, especially when you get into the realm of, hey, some of these companies that are distilleries, uh, they, they're public companies. Right. They're not they're not the Heaven Hills, you know, the family run company. This is Beam Centauri. Right. They're interested in shareholder value and that the bottles of their product have a value. And if it's seen that there is another avenue to unlock the greater value of those bottles, why would they not redirect that inventory to this other market where they can actually get that value? Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what. Uh, Ticketmaster Live Nation ended up doing, and actually Ticketmaster Live Nation, the promoters, the venues, the artists, very interestingly enough, um, for their shows go right to the secondary market. So they're getting those, you know, it's, it might have a face value for whatever that's worth of 30, 40 bucks, but really the artist is getting a good chunk of the 200, 300, 400 dollars that's going for in the secondary market. In the same way that, again, Beam Suntory, they launch, I don't know, they're just twelve off the top of my head, right? Oh, the, the signature 12 year. Oh, it's, you know, they were normally the MSRPing at, you know, 50. Like, wait a minute. We, they have assessed or, you know, that the value of that is actually 100 or so. Why the hell are someone else taking that 50 bucks as a Beam Suntory shareholder, mind you? That's the, you know, the, the avenue to take there. It's like, no, we have, this is a very valid, we've created now this legal secondary market. Um, is a perfectly good way for them to take and unlock the value of, of those bottles and getting 50 bucks just as a, you know, thing, uh, more per bottle. Wow. That's, I mean, in other that's, words, it's a Pandora's you, box you're opening it. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say you opened up a can of worms while we're opening things up here because, I mean, I couldn't even imagine if if that were the thing that, uh, yeah, the 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 beams, the Willets, the um, Four Roses, the, the small distilleries down in Texas, whatever it is, the... You know, and, and there is there is too much red tape. There is too many laws today that that don't allow this to happen. To just go straight to secondary, um, and and you bring up a good point of like, God, what what if that day actually came to be able to say, yeah, let's let's break down all these barriers. Like you you make the product, you own the product, you figure out how to sell the product, and and the fact that it's a controlled substance is is the bad part of it. You know how it has to has to be in regards to that you can't actually necessarily do uh what's best for commerce i guess you could say sometimes but i, I couldn't imagine a world that that happened and honestly I, I don't think it would be terrible if it did happen well and you you kind of have some people doing that sort of art like will it's i mean hell they'll Jack, well, they're they're pricing, but that's that's a little bit different um they're pricing to be able to make sure that they're okay for themselves but they're still there's still there's still a hand being traded to be able to make sure that they that you know they're still following the three tier system. However, yes, everybody does. Even it doesn't matter what uh, distillery you work for, there is somebody on the inside that's in the groups that knows secondary values, and they're like, y'all, we need to keep bumping these prices up because people aren't going to stop buying. Well, not but they're they're taking doing these prices to try and to deter, I guess, it from going to secondary um, market. And so they're kind of doing, but I mean, it's not working yet because it's not gotten so crazy out of control. But uh, like, for instance, you know, the Christmas I went to Willits and they were having 10 year rise for $300 and 14 years for $450. And I'm like, well, that's <laughs> way out of my, and, I, and that's way out of my price range. And, uh, and then I just don't see anybody paying six, 700 bucks for that, for those types of bottles, you know? And, but, so I don't know, you know, if they do that, would that kind of help do what we're talking about, I guess? Yeah, I guess Nate, that's a good question. I mean, should, should they, should distilleries start pricing things so absurdly that it does sort of start killing this market little by little? Well, I could be, uh, I mean, look at uh, Dave Pickerel, may he rest in peace. That was definitely his view. That's why, you know, Whistlepig was, or the um, Boss Hogs were 500 bucks uh, retail. And it's that that has stayed relatively consistent. Um, mm -hmm. They still obviously shows up in the secondary market just because people are, you know, need to resell. It's like it's the, the role of the secondary market is not just for making money. It's some bits of it's just to resell it. Like I have this good. I no longer yeah, it's want access it. more than anything. Exactly. So it's uh, in the end. I mean, uh, so there's so many companies in the bourbon world that are private. 
You don't have to follow. They follow whatever hell rules they want. Sazerac being the biggest among them, of course. So they don't have that shareholder pressure. I'm just, I think you think of the companies with the public companies and that kind of pressure um, from their shareholders. And it's just, you know, the, the, the nice things we talk about as bourbon enthusiasts and, you know, the way that Heaven Hill runs their, like the, the family aspect and the, yeah, we don't want it. We want to keep bourbon uh, affordable for everyone. So I keep the prices low. They don't quite fly when it comes to a public company and public shareholders have got to stand up in front and wonder, you know, why they're they're why that X amount of dollars per every bottle sold is going to someone else when it could be coming to the distillery. Mm-hmm. Sure. So, I mean, certainly Willet, Willet is, that, is actually a quite interesting example. I mean, because it wasn't just, I mean, Kenny, you, you, you guys are right there. You know how fast those prices have gone up at the gift shop itself. You know, in the past year or two, I had a, a guy that uh, lives right around there, a friend of mine that I gave him some uh, some money to grab me whatever they had. And it was, you know, a great 14 year bourbon. And he got it for 250 bucks for what, two years ago. Um, and what are they going? You said they were 450, 14 years or so. They were for a little bit, but then they've they've kind of dropped down. They've been kind of all over the place. You yeah. can't really uh, can't put it down because I mean, yeah. they just had a fifteen <laughs> year really that was two fifty. Um, so it's I like, just want to go back to the days when it's just ten bucks. a yeah, year. Yeah, ten bucks a year was. Yeah, it would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's, I don't. I think those days are behind us. <laughs> oh yes, they are. And and I kind of want to sort of wrap this up with with one final question. And that is to say that, you know, we Nate had mentioned, you know, we're in the media. We are bringing this to light like this is a thing, um, but we're not the only ones that have brought it to light. Like there's there's countless articles that are out there. Uh, There's been spirit industry shows where they have uh, breakout sessions on sort of stuff like this, too. So nobody's unaware of this. But let's just say that the government is sitting behind uh, the lines right now and they're watching everything. They're taking notes and they're figuring out how do they close down every secondary market outlet in one night? Um, with how large this has gone through a community aspect, do you think that if we're, they were to close everything in one night, would it actually prevent a secondary market or would it be like, just like everything, what else would happens? Like you shut down a Facebook group, there's 12 more that are going to spin up right behind it. Well, yeah, it, the demand's not going anywhere, certainly. And the beneficiaries would be the retailers who are charging secondary prices right now. I mean, you want the, you can, all you do is a quick check on Wine Searcher will tell you all you need to know about that, you know, no matter what, what state you're in. So while you, do, you would lose the trading aspect and the community aspect of it, demand wouldn't go away and people want bottles. They'll just say, pay the same prices they're willing to pay, you know, someone over in Ohio. They would just go to their you know, liquor store or go online and get a ship from New York and pay New York prices. It'll mm-hmm. just happen. If they want it, they'll they'll get it through, you know, through another avenue. In this case, you know, obviously a legal one through a retailer. Um, but, yeah, it, you would lose you lose the community, lose the trading, but you don't lose the demand. I mean, if, if that's the. It I might just the increase the demand. It might increase the demand. <laughs> yeah, I, it, right. You then the retailers are like, wait a minute. I don't have this whole gray market or black market to deal with. Um, I can uh, make it even, you know, price even higher. And there's someone that's willing to come, you know, and, and drop that kind of uh, cash on it. Mm-hmm. So that's unfortunately, a- yeah, I, I, it, this problem has a lot of, uh, the, the issue of the secondary market has so many different angles and so many different things to, you know, it's, it means a lot to, the bourbon means a lot to people. I mean, it's a very personal kind of product. Um, and in and, and the history of Kentucky, and it's unique industry, unique product, unique people. It's going to be it's going to be an effort. It's going to be an effort. I think I mean, the, the ship once I think it's a good thing that they're starting. You know, they're kind of taking the whack with the shipping. Like, let's just start there. Yeah. You know, vice, you know, access and distribution. And and, and, and I you guys talked a lot about Amazon on Tuesday. I would be I would not be surprised whether there's a team. That's uh, that's been working long and hard for a long time to try to crack this nut. And there's a lot of highly paid people with a lot of money and a lot of access. And don't be surprised if it comes to pass. Yeah, I always wonder, like <laughs> with someone with Will, like Willits or any if, if shipping were legal, you know, to get it to the people that want it, would there ever have been, you know, a, a secondary market or need for that? Um, just because. We're, People around here just 
do it to make money. You know, they go to the store to flip it and, or go to the gift shop to buy them and flip them because they know like there's a buyer out there that will get them that can't get them right now. But if there was a legal way to access them, would there even be a need for a secondary market? Well, that's I think that's um, that's one corner case. Yeah. With it. You know, mm-hmm. that's just that's just one distillery, I think. And, and I think for the most part, uh, most distilleries, I don't know if they'll ever want to get to that point because they're 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 so large and so vast that that would create its own huge operation to even deal with that sort of thing. So who knows? The numbers, the numbers don't bear out. I'm looking here market share of the leading whiskey brands in 2017, 2018, any guesses on the top five, which make up half of the whiskey market. Uh, I believe there is Jameson. There's one out of India. I think that was like one of the largest whiskey oh, companies no, that, that, that's that out would there. Be, that, that's world. I know the way yeah. you're talking about that's a world. This is just the U.S. Number one, Jack Daniels. Number two, Crown Royal. Number three, Fireball. Number four, Jim Beam. Number five, Jameson. There yeah. is half your market in five brands. The stuff mm-hmm. we're talking about, the volume, the supply, it is not even a yeah, it's peanuts. Two. And it's and it would create. For that, for to, to distillery focus on there, um, just a big headache. A, no and, a, and, a, and a legal, you know what I mean? It's like it's a focus thing for them, unless, unless it becomes more, it becomes so advantageous for them to example, like as they sell a higher volume product and make twenty five bucks, fifty bucks more per bottle. That's a different story. Hell, I didn't know Fireball was more in demand than Jameson. That's good news for me. But you know, point four eight percent of the market. It's fascinating. Wow. This stuff fascinates me. It really does. Because like Jack Daniels at thirteen point two seven percent of the U.S. market last year. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's a lot. I mean, it's a lot of volume. It's, it, it's we don't think about that because you know it's not something we probably don't drink. We drink we drink it rarely. We only think of ourselves. Every <laughs> let's, let's every single bar. Every single blessing. Everything we talk about does not benefit the greater public. It would just benefit us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nate, I want to say thank you so much for for coming on the show today. It was a, it was a pleasure to have you uh, and and bring this topic up because I think it's it's very timely. It's it's very pretty much the forefront of anybody that is a bourbon geek. Like this is this is the stuff we talk and think about every single day. Yeah, there's not a day or night that. I'm not scrolling through secondary market posts to see what's selling, what's not, what's people after. I mean, it's a part of our my, our daily life, and it consumes us. So, yeah, it's definitely a hot topic for all of us. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. I think somebody in the chat said they were scrolling through BSM, you know, BSM as, as, as they were listening. listening. So, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, that's 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 this is what we do. Yeah. You know. Yep. But I think we have a. A pretty good system the way it is now and so maybe we just leave it as be mm-hmm. so uh nate thank you once again uh make sure you follow bourbon pursuit on facebook twitter and instagram at bourbon pursuit and also help the show support the show be a part of this community that that we're building right here on patreon patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit because one of the great things that you get as a part of this is being able to watch these shows and actually comment as they're happening live. And so we had uh, a few people in and I'm getting really mad at hangouts because we can't see exactly how many people I know. were in the show or are actually watching live anymore. So I got to go back and see what sort of views there were. But, mm. <laughs> um, you know, this was, uh, this is also, it's a, it's just fun uh, to be a part of this. And so thank you so much. And thank you, Nate, for being a part of the community sure. as well. Yeah. Thank you yeah. guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. And as always, uh, we love show suggestions, feedback, comments. Uh, let us know what you want to hear. Nate, Appreciate you hanging out with us and talking about an interesting topic. Appreciate the support, and uh, we'll see you next time.